Hello, this is the Stories Beside channel. I release videos every day for you. Subscribe and click the bell. Near the office of the Komsomol Bureau of the Moscow Pedagogical Institute, in anxious anticipation, were crowded 35 people from the Faculty of Foreign Languages. Today, a very serious question was being decided. Who of the graduates would work as an interpreter at the 6th World Festival of Youth and Students? According to rumors, which under the strictest secrecy pass to each other, students will select only 10 people. Each candidate has already been vetted several times by the State Security Committee for their trustworthiness. Teachers gave their opinion on the level of language proficiency. All that remained was to get the support of the Komsomol leaders. Young men and women nervously walked along the corridor and repeated the hard-to-pronounce names of Communist Party leaders from different countries. Outwardly, they tried to calm down and support each other, but in reality they saw in each classmate a rival who could overtake them at the finish line to achieve their dreams. Even just being a spectator at an unprecedented in its grandiosity and openness event was already a happiness. What to speak of working with delegations, dealing directly with foreigners, attending all the events and other privileges that came with being an official interpreter. Sophia Moore also came to the interview, but kept a low profile. In principle, this was the case before. Practically all the places at the Faculty of Foreign Languages were occupied by Muscovites, who at every opportunity tried to show their superiority over the provincial ones. And Sofia was just one of those very newcomers, who, as the locals believed, were taking away their legitimate vacancies in prestigious universities. She was born and lived until the age of 17 in the capital of a tiny autonomous region in the Caucasus, which later became a republic. The Moore family was one of the most prominent in the city. Her father, John, returning from the front, quickly moved up the career ladder and by the early 50s firmly took the place of the second secretary of the regional committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Not lied behind him and his wife, Molly. Sophia mother during the war years, when the Nases were chased out of the Caucasus, she headed the hospital and then became chief physician of the hospital. Of course, an experienced and respected doctor could have gotten a higher post, but the woman did not want to stop officials from medicine. In general, the girl was lucky to be born into a wealthy, intelligent family, where the parents managed to carry through all the years in hardships of love and reverent attitude to each other. As for the knight, she was the center of the family universe, as her two older brothers were taken to Germany and died there, and she was the only child left. Sophia fully corresponded to the ideals of the youth of that time. She was a Komsomol activist, and even more beautiful. In her school years, the girl absolutely lacked snobbery, and a sense of superiority towards her classmates, which could quite logically be a consequence of the position of her parents. She was even ashamed to wear fashionable and expensive things. That her father brought her from business trips and tried to be like everyone else, she did not go to Moscow to study because of the prestige of education in the capital. Sophia would have been quite satisfied with the local pedagogical institute if French was studied there. Her grandmother, a graduate of the Smolny Institute of Noble Maidens, brought her love for it, as well as manners that became unfashionable in those years. But about this page of the history of the family then preferred not to remember. By the end of school, Sophia perfectly spoke two languages, German and French. In the certificate had only A's, so she easily passed the exams and became a student of the capital's university. She left home with tears in her eyes. The attachment to her relatives, to the city, and to her friends was too strong. But Sophia was a purposeful girl, and Komsomol upbringing instilled in her that the meaning of human life is overcoming difficulties. So Sophia stood at the window and waited patiently to be invited to the bureau office. Like the other applicants, she was eager to get to the festival, but it would not be a tragedy for her to be rejected. Another very important event in the girl's life was coming up next summer, a wedding. Sophia accepted the proposal of her classmate, Nathan Stephen, with whom, as she laughingly said, she was ending a five-year epistolary romance. It was quite expensive to call around town then. So the young people communicated only by letter. They waited for the cherished envelope, 
then reread it several times and wrote a reply. Sophia reasoned so sign as the relatives insisted. Both sides could do it in the fall. But no one would postpone the festival because of her wedding. So she prioritized the event that all young people in the USR were waiting for, even those who had never dreamed of going to the grandiose festival. Finally, the girl secretary looked out into the corridor and loudly pronounced more Sophia, and on the habitual movement corrected the already perfect hairstyle discerned on the skirt in visible folds. She checked if her Komsomol badge was in place and walked confidently into the office. The presiding officer, a recent graduate of the same university, had already managed to acquire the manners of a Komsomol official. He sat in his chair with all his appearance, showing his own importance on both sides. From him sat the activists and looked at Moore with a serious look, as if they had seen her. It was the first time they had encountered the girl every day at the institute. In the corner of the room sat an unremarkable man in a gray suit, who pretended with all his might that he had little interest in what was going on in the classroom. And he was here completely by accident. First the girls explained the responsibility of the interpreters, for they would have to convince the guests of the advantages of the socialist way of life in addition to their main duties. And then, as if from a horn of plenty, the questions poured in. Sophia did not see how knowing the surname of the leader of a progressive party, of some tiny African state, would enable her to be more persuasive. But she diligently invented everything that was printed in the manual. So she answered without a hitch. We will consult with our comrades and report our decision after considering all the candidates, said the presiding officer. After Sophia's brilliant answers, stretching the pleasure of feeling of her own omnipotence, the level of her knowledge in the field of foreign languages, none of those present asked. Sophia left the office. Those who were about to be interviewed immediately rushed to her. They began to ask questions. The girl did not tell anything new, and the interest in her disappeared. Young people continued, it seems, along the corridor and examining each other. Two more hours passed before the same girl. The secretary came out to the applicants and in a solemn voice read out ten names of students who were invited for further conversation. She deliberately took long pauses before naming the next lucky applicant and looked at the audience with the eyes of a fate maker more. Sophia pronounced the girl in a nasty voice. Further admonition warning bordering on threats and wishing fruitful work in the dissemination of communist ideas throughout the world. She listened with half an ear. Her thoughts were occupied with how to tell Stephen that the wedding was postponed, however briefly only for a couple of months, but postponed. No, I shouldn't write about it. And it's better not to talk about it on the phone. He said he'd be here in May. I'll tell him the news, Sophia thought. The girl was taken out of these thoughts by the solemn voice of an unpleasant man who addressed the future interpreters. From next week until the beginning of the festival you will undergo special training, where you will be explained how to answer provocative questions. Believe me, there will be some. I advise you to reread the documents of the 20th Congress of our native Communist Party in order not to fall for the provocateurs. We hope that you will justify the trust of the party in Komsomol and will worthily represent the Soviet youth at the festival. In the dormitory, Sophia was returning in a joyful mood. On the way she noted as yet little visible signs of the coming of spring. The snow that had fallen, bound in a dense shell, still lay on the lawns and flower beds, but the sidewalks and roads were already completely solid. The sky was high and blue, like a grabar painting. The February azure was worth moving farther away from the noisy streets, as the shrill shadow of the seed roots became audible. Even the air took on some special, pleasant aroma. A thaw, a real thaw. So the real spring is just around the corner. Sophia thought, and was surprised that she suddenly began to think poetically. At home already crocus must have bloomed in cycles, and the frosts are wild. Sophia smiled remembering how in high school they used to go with Stephen to the mountains to admire the sharp polar feather frosts. Thoughts of the man who would very soon be her husband filled her heart with tenderness with love. Is it allowed to be so happy, Sophia thought. Everything conceived is carried out as if by magic. The girl decided to keep a festive mood, 
ran into the pastry shop, bought cakes to treat her roommates. When she entered the room, the girls pounced on her with questions. How'd it go? Did you get in? Did you get in? Sophia answered excitedly. And what about the wedding? Olga asked. Can the wedding wait? Sophia replied confidently. Not every year we have such events in our country. Look, they will steal your fiancé. But it's okay. You'll find yourself a foreigner. You will go to Africa and live in a straw hut under palm trees. Laughing, Zoya warned her friend. Such a future seemed fantastic. To assume that a Soviet girl would marry a foreigner and leave her homeland. It was like marrying a Russian and flying to another planet. And the very word foreigner had a special meaning for Soviet people. Eh, you're a future teacher, and where in Africa does straw come from? Also cheerfully replied Sophia, not allowing the slightest thought that Zoe's prediction could come true at least by 1%. Enough fantasizing. Let's drink tea and cakes. Stephen really came to Moscow on the eve of May Day. The girls tactfully moved in with their friends for a while, giving the whole room to the lovers. As expected, Sophia. Nathan, of course, was upset that the wedding would have to be postponed from July to September, but he did not dissuade his future wife from working during the festival. Such a chance could only come once in a lifetime, and it would be extremely stupid not to take advantage of it. But Sophia assured him that she would try to get him an invitation to the opening, waiting for the guests. The capital was being transformed every day. The latest work was being done on Lesniki. The new stadium was specially built for the opening ceremony. In the tourist and Ukraine hotels, where it was planned to accommodate the most honored guests, new furniture was being brought in. The central streets of the city were being spruced up. Not far from the river station, a new park was being marked out, which according to tradition will be laid by the guests of the festival. Sophia's life turned into an endless daily marathon. In the morning, she ran to the institute, where the last session was in full swing, then went to the classes organized for the interpreters of the delegations. In the evenings, she was preparing for the defense of her diploma, and at night she was perusing the method books that were handed out every week. To all the staff involved in serving the guests, the girl already knew that she would work with the delegation of the French Sudan and try to learn something about this mysterious country. Time was disastrously short, and already two letters from Stephen remained unanswered. Every day, she gave herself her word that today she would write a letter, but it never came. Early one morning, there was a knock on the door of the room, and a worried concierge appeared on the doorstep. More to the telephone. Someone died there. Sophia ran down the stairs with bated breath and scolded herself for not writing to her parents lately. Could it be the grandmother? Or maybe the father. She thought anxiously. Sophia grabbed the phone, expecting to hear tragic news. But Stephen's cheerful voice sounded. Don't worry. Everything's fine at home. I had to pull a stunt to get you on the phone. I've been calling for a week now, but the concierge flatly refused to invite you. What's wrong? Why aren't you answering your emails? Nathan blurted it all out in a hurry, not giving and not giving a second thought. When the girl realized there was no trouble, she wanted to burst into an angry tirade, but in time drew attention to the duty officer who stood nearby and overheard the conversation. It is very sorry that your grandfather passed away, but I, unfortunately, cannot come to the funeral. The day after tomorrow is the last exam. Give my condolences to all the family, which grandfather and who died. Stephen started to ask questions but quickly realized that Sophia was not alone. Sweetheart, I miss you so much. Don't scare me like that again. I thought you'd forgotten all about me. When will your exile in the capital end and we can never be apart again? The concierge lost interest in the conversation and went to her room to clean herself up. Before you know it, when is your defense? Sophia asked, you're late with your question. I told you the date in my letter but you probably didn't read it with resentment in your voice," Nathan replied. As of yesterday, I am a graduate and a highway construction engineer. Sorry, sorry about the territory. Sophia, I forgot. 
but I honestly read the letters. It's just that I'm in such a tedium right now that all the events in my head are jumbled up. Then there were mutual declarations of love, lamentations of separation, and other sentimental talk. You haven't forgotten your promise, have you? Stephen asked. Of course I haven't forgotten. I will marry you, she said cheerfully. Nathan hesitated. He was referring to the invitation card. Sophia must have understood him and added, and I haven't forgotten about the invitation. So I'm waiting for you in Moscow in July. At that time, a voice sounded behind Sophia's back. Unheard, the concierge came up. Stop occupying the service phone. I see the children are not very upset. A hey, youth. Young people were told about the death of a loved one, and she immediately turned the conversation to love. Sophia didn't wait for another injection. The older woman thanked her and quickly headed to her room. Moore successfully defended her diploma thesis and received a distribution in her hometown, which from the outside looked like a miracle. In fact, there were no miracles since the girl was studying on a referral. She could not go home immediately after receiving her diploma. The last preparations for the festival were underway, so the parents themselves arrived in Moscow to congratulate their daughter and at the same time to buy her a traditional white wedding dress with a photo. As the grandmother insisted, John by work in the capital was often in the capital, and Molly Lass came five years ago, when the daughter was just entering the institute. The woman was amazed at how the city had changed over that time. It was like being in another world, she said, walking along the central avenues and the embankment. Banners with welcoming slogans in different languages were hanging everywhere. The streets were lined with brand new Icaruses, which were running the routes of the delegations and the legendary Volga. There was such an abundance of goods in the stores that one's eyes were dazzled. Even before the arrival of guests from different countries, the festive atmosphere was felt in everything. It's a pity we didn't take my grandmother with us, because she has been nostalgic for the old times lately. Let her look at our new times, happy Sophia. What are the prospects for young people? And after the festival, she'll give her knowledge of foreign languages. The whole world will lie before you. Mom, why do I need the whole world? I rejoice that very soon the whole family will be together again, answered the girl, and quite sincerely. Right daughter said, John joined the conversation. Where you were born, there and useful. And then you will get married. You'll give us grandchildren. We can consider our life a success. The Moore couple had to leave Moscow a few days before the opening of the festival. John was urgently summoned to work, but Stephen arrived, as promised. He waited patiently until Sophia was free, and then they walked around the city and enjoyed every minute spent together. Will it always be like this? Sophia asked after one magical night. Of course, as you still haven't realized that we were made for each other. I, for one, knew that since high school. And who made us? Sophia laughed. Didn't you get into religion later, while I wasn't around? Do you want to get married like my grandmother? No, I didn't get religious. But I do believe that everyone has a soulmate, Stephen replied. And my soulmate. And it's better that it's you. Sophia glanced at the alarm clock and jumped out of bed. I'm late. They must have been looking for me for a long time. After all, the delegation I'm supposed to accompany is arriving today. It's a disaster. The girl ran around the room, trying to dress, do her hair, and make up her eyes and lips at the same time. From not being able to do everything at once, she almost cried. How will I look the first time I see you? She wouldn't stop. You'll look fine. Stephen tried to reassure her. Even if someone had tried to ruin your charming image, they wouldn't have succeeded. Fortunately, there was no disaster. According to the established rules, the meeting was scheduled for an hour and a half earlier than it was necessary to leave for the station, so the late arrival was not noticed by anyone. All those gathered were enthusiastically waiting. During the three months of preparation, the young people had gotten to know each other and were now happily discussing the upcoming events. Finally, buses with the names of the states and national flags stenciled on them entered the square in front of the hotel. 
Sophia found Oldman David in the crowd, a representative of the district Komsomol committee with whom she was to work, and they headed for their transportation. There was an unprecedented excitement at the Kivsky station. In a few minutes the arrival of a train from Odessa was expected, on which delegations from African countries were arriving, and she was even afraid that she would not be able to gather her charges. But David calmed her down. Don't worry, we are insured if someone gets lost. And indeed, soon young men in colorful outfits came to them accompanied by girls in national Russian costumes. Some of them wore headdresses resembling either the beginning or a turban. Welcome to Moscow, Sofia pronounced in French, and the guests almost chorus answered in broken Russian. To peace and friendship. These words sounded like a response to a password. Sofia heard them a hundred times a day. A young man in a civilized suit, Elijah, separated from the group and introduced himself. I am leading our delegation, and I am glad to have the opportunity to visit the greatest nations of the world. Then the man made an obviously prepared speech that the youth of the French student knew a lot about the Soviet Union and dreamed of spreading its experience to all the countries of Africa. David, who did not understand a word of the guest's speech, asked for a translation, but she answered very briefly. French Sudan and the USSR are friends forever. All the time Elijah was making his fiery speech, it was Elijah who was looking at the guest. His appearance was different from the other men in the delegation. Despite his dark skin color, distinctive and stripped down nose, stiff spirals of black hair and large lips, his eyes were a deep blue color. What is this some kind of mutation? Or does the head of the delegation belong to a nationality that was not mentioned in the briefing? I thought just at that moment the man finished speaking, and the guests shouted again. To peace and friendship, David intended to say something in response, but K. And a man came up and quietly, but very insistently told her to take the delegation to the bus, because another train was coming. Please follow me. She invited the arrivals. It took the rest of the day to place the delegation members in the hotel and put them in the hands of the attendants, tell them about the plans for the day ahead and answer all their questions, but that they didn't say anything provocative. Asked David. When they left the hotel in the evening, they didn't say anything. They must have been handed out the manuals too. What can be asked and what should not be asked? Sophia answered. If anything, let me know right away so I can take action. Well tired, replied Sophia. But it seems to me that they came to us not for provocation, but to see the world. And you want to see the world too? David asked cautiously. Of course I do. I will definitely try to go to the next festival. How will you get there? I can tell your future like a gypsy. The festival will pass. You'll marry your boyfriend have children and settle down with some sadness, said David. Are you in love with me by any chance? Sophia laughed. You'll say I've fallen in love. That I do not have enough muscovites. He denied it, but by the tone of the girl realized that her assumption is not far from the truth. The next day was the opening of the festival. Many people did not yet believe that foreigners would just walk the streets of Moscow, that they could be approached, talked to, photographed. As early as in the morning, Muscovites and guests of the capital who had arrived from different republics began to gather on Prospect Mira along the route of the procession of delegations from Vidin and K. Open trucks with foreign delegations headed towards the Lesniki Stadium. On both sides of the road stood tens of 1,000 spectators. The bravest ran up to the cars to shake hands with the delegates. Mutual greetings were heard in different languages. Sophia gave in to the general enthusiasm. She waved her arms and shouted loudly for peace and friendship. From time to time, the girl noticed Elijah's piercing gaze on her and smiled back at him. With Stephen, they agreed to meet near the central entrance to Lesniki, but it was impossible to do so. The crowd was swirling like a maelstrom, and it was as difficult to find a person in the noisy stream as a needle in a haystack. They saw each other only when they were in the stands. I thought you weren't going to make it here, Sophia said. The girl was about to sit next to her future husband. But David, wanting to demonstrate his authority, strictly said, 
Outsiders have no place among foreign delegations. Please leave the Tribune. Don't be a nuisance. Do you have Stephen's invitation card? Answered instead of Stephen Sophia. Fanfare sounded, and the two-week-long festive marathon began. Life in the capital turned into an incessant carnival, which lasted 24 o'clock a day. While for the first few days all members of the French Sudanese delegation tried to stay together, once they were free, each participant chose an activity of his or her choice. David was very nervous as events began to unfold out of order, and she calmed him down. To no avail. It's good for you to speak. Your job is only to translate. And I should tragically side Oldman, with all his appearance showing that on his shoulders lies a huge responsibility, and almost the fate of the world depends on him. Since it was no longer possible to get the delegation together, Sophia decided that she should be with the leader. But David found nothing better to do than to stay with Sophia. Such company was not satisfactory. He showed with all his appearance that Oldman was superfluous, but the Komsomol worker ignored the unequivocal glances of the African guest and spat after them to the Udarnik cinema, where the screening of the competition films began, to the Dinamo Stadium to watch a circus performance for an evening of solidarity with the youth of colonial countries. In general, followed the shadow everywhere. Isn't your colleague tired of following us? Elijah asked one day, it's his job. He's just doing his job faithfully. Sophia replied, it's a strange job to interfere with people's lives. Does he bother you? Sophia wondered. Not me, but us. I can see how you speak with his presence. What are you talking about? David couldn't resist asking. Elijah asks if we can come to his country to visit. Sophia lied. And what did you tell them? Of course we can. Soviet youth are always ready to support comrades from countries fighting for independence. An ironic smile flashed across Elijah's face, and Sophia thought that he understood Russian speech, but immediately dismissed the thought. Well done, David said, translated to him. That Soviet Komsomol members are always ready to support their African brothers. Mr. Neville wishes you many interesting meetings, Sophia translated. Suddenly, David extended his hand to the man as a sign that he too was ready to join the ranks of freedom fighters. A more ridiculous situation was hard to imagine. Sophia could barely hold back from laughing, and the African brother deliberately, as it seemed to the girl, tightened the handshake. The next day, Elijah decided to add to the struggle for peace and friendship the struggle for independence of a single individual from an annoying guardian. He had gone to the trouble of being cunning. In the morning, the man appeared in the hall, where Moore and Oldman were already waiting for him along with a black girl in a national costume. Sophia remembered, as the girl knew a little Russian and tried to speak Russian to the interpreter. After mutual greetings, Elijah addressed David seriously. I ask you very much to escort the girl first to the conference and then to the ball in honor of the girls of the world. And she must be there because she is the head of the youth women's movement in our country. I would gladly keep her company myself but as the head of the delegation, I am obliged to attend the reception today. Sophia translated the man's words verbatim. David barely managed to portray a smile on his face, and he hastily assured her that he would read it as an honor to be the girl's companion. He went on to say that in the Soviet Union, women enjoyed the same rights as men. In general, expressively proclaimed a speech from the methodology. Did you intentionally bring a girl with you today so that she would steal Neville asked Sophia. Did you? Objected Elijah. But his satisfied look showed that the girl's assumption hit the mark. You do realize that it is unseemly to appear at a ball unaccompanied by a girl's bow. And I am very glad that Comrade Oldman has kindly agreed to keep me company. The whole day the young people walked alone in the city. More than once Sophia noted to herself that her companion was making conversation so that she was forced to tell about herself. However, she had nothing to hide, as her biography was without a single dark spot. What do you do in your homeland? Having finished the story about her family, she tried to move the conversation. Sophia, I, my life, unfortunately, is less interesting. I live with my parents, brothers, and sisters. 
I work as a mining engineer, head of the youth union. And where did you get your education? Asked the girl in Paris at the École Polytechnique. Elijah's answer caused some confusion. A simple boy from a colony country was educated in Paris. This fact did not fit the worldview instilled in Soviet youth. How did you get to Paris? She asked. I took a boat to Le Havre, and from there, I took a train to Paris. Asking the question, Sophia, of course, did not mean the method of transportation, but she did not ask again. She felt an uneasiness still incomprehensible to her, as if she had stepped on slippery ice and had to maneuver. The man noticed the change in the girl's mood and tried to correct the situation. At that time, columns of circus performers were passing along the street. Sofia recognized Oleg Popov, standing on the hood of a truck and holding ropes in his hands like reins. She smiled and clapped her hands. The clown alternately dipped his free hand into the seemingly dimensionless pockets of his plaid pants, pulled small boutiques out of them, instantly transformed into flowers, and tossed them to the audience. Sofia caught one of them and rejoiced like a child. I can show tricks too, Elijah said. Dropping his hand into his suit pocket, he pulled out a velvet box and opened it. There was a thin ring with a small stone that shimmered in the sun with different colors. He held out the box, and not but she hesitated. The girl remembered well the prohibition against taking expensive gifts from foreigners. But the ring was so modest that she could not call it expensive. The wedding ring covering almost the whole phalanx of her finger, which Stephen had bought her on her last visit, was really expensive. Seeing Sophia's hesitation, the man took her hand and put the ring on her finger at the window. Now you and I are doomed, said Elijah, smiling. But Sophia took these words as a joke. Before the government reception, Sophia was very nervous. Before this Khrushchev, Zhukov, Furtseva she had seen only on the podium of the mausoleum during demonstrations, and now she had the honor of being in the same hall with them. But what worried her even more was Elijah's changed behavior. From time to time, he took her small hand in his palm. At first sight, harmless touch caused Sophia a storm of emotions in her body. A chill ran through her body, and her heart became in anticipation of something new, unexplored and dangerous. The girl persistently chased these feelings. She deceived herself, but waking up in her female essence did not give rest. Her body responded violently to every man's touch. Nonsense. I have a fiancé to whom I gave my virginity. I love him. Soon we'll be man and wife. And everything else is a mirage, an obsession. Sophia tried to convince herself, but it was hard to convince herself. After the government reception, Elijah invited her to his room to discuss the program of the last festival days. But she, citing fatigue, refused. That night she couldn't sleep for a long time. Stephen and her new African acquaintance alternately appeared before her eyes, and she felt that she had fallen into a trap from which she could not get out. If she could, she'd love to go home to her fiancé today, and everything would be back to normal. But the girl understood that such behavior would not remain without negative consequences. Now she remembered Oldman with hope and decided firmly that she would no longer be alone with the younger one. Before dawn, Sophia was tormented by nightmares, and it was as if she were seeing excerpts from the movie circus, only as Marion Dixon. She was black, too. The baby was her son. Just wish Oldman was at the hotel in the morning. Waking up, she thought. David was indeed waiting for Sophia in the lobby, but dumbfounded her with the news. He would not be able to accompany her today. And since he was taking a delegate to the monument to Zoya Kosmodomianskaya, he had been joined to the French delegation by the girl's efforts. For the first time in all her time with Oldman Sophia, regretted that he would not be around. She hopefully offered to take them with her, but David replied that there were no vacant seats in the minibus. Sophia's mood was very uneasy. She couldn't make sense of her feelings and counted the hours to get rid of Elijah's company. The man didn't seem to notice her confusion. He put his arm around her shoulders in a friendly way, which again caused a storm of emotion, no matter how much she wanted to push them away. 
Eventually, she admitted to herself that the man's touch was pleasant to her, when as if in a burst of joy kissed Sophia on the cheek, and she was overwhelmed by a hot wave. The lines of a poem by a young poet came to her memory, which was read by all the female students of the Pedagogical Institute. Maybe it was just this kind of treason, the worst kind of treason. Finally, the last day of the festival came. By evening, the whole delegation was gathered. The mood of the young men and women was both uplifted and sad. As it happens on the first weekday after the holidays, the magical carnival night began, and the streets of the city center turned into ballrooms. Soviet youth, to whom only a slit of the Iron Curtain had been opened, felt the euphoria of the freedom of madness. Young men and women kissed unashamedly in the streets. Couples were formed lightning fast even though everyone knew perfectly well that no continuation would follow. The authorities, most of all afraid that the capitalists would bring ampoules of the plague of bacteria to Moscow, had overlooked the possibility of a quick and eternal sexual revolution and were now trying unsuccessfully to do something about it. Elijah and together with the delegation found themselves on Leninsky Gori, where the opening of the ball was held. To her surprise, the girl noted that the African guest was fine, as if before a trip to the USSR. Long rehearsed, but for Sofia every dance was torture. She felt as if the man's hands were leaving burns on her skin. The atmosphere united her. Sometimes, the girl caught herself thinking that if she had the chance, she would go with a stranger tomorrow to a distant and unfamiliar Africa, if he had called. But it was as if Elijah did not notice the girl's condition and did not even make any hints. The impression was that he was completely absorbed in the carnival and was watching all the events. There seemed to be no end to the fun, but dawn came suddenly. The colors became paler. The music sounded quieter. Buses began to arrive at the crowded places and took the delegates to their hotels. That's the end of the fairy tale, Sophia said in Russian. No, the fairy tale is just beginning. We'll definitely be together, Elijah answered, though he wasn't sure about it. Sophia looked at the man questioningly, but to find out how he knew Russian and why she hid it, she did not want to. And then they, as if everything was agreed in advance, went to the hotel room. And they loved each other for a long time, tenderly and doomed. The girl gave herself completely, without a trace, as if Elijah were the only man on earth. A few hours later, she saw him off at the train station, where the train was leaving for Odessa, the ship Georgia, on which delegates from African countries were traveling to their black continent, was already waiting for the festival guests. I'll write to you, Elijah kept saying. You'll see, in a year or two, French Sudan will no longer be a colony and then nothing will prevent us from meeting. Elija Maga's political predictions came true, but the meeting had to wait 35 years. Back in the dormitory, Sophia began to pack her things and put her thoughts in order. She already fed herself for the rash act and assured herself that she should not have given in to emotions. What to do next? Tell Stephen about the affair and scrap all her plans, or keep silent. She could not force herself to forget about what had happened, nor could she consult anyone in this matter. Not even with her grandmother, who used to confide all her secrets, and to pack and suitcases, and began to look at the festival photos. There was nothing objectionable on them. And she folded them again into a large envelope. Her gaze fell on the ring given to Elijah. A ray of sunlight fell on the pebble, and little sparks ran across the walls. The girl took it off her finger, wrapped it in a scrap of newspaper, and put it in a hidden pocket of her bag. At that time, there was a knock at the door. On the threshold stood a smiling old man with a bouquet of flowers. I came to say goodbye. You said you were leaving. You haven't changed your mind about leaving the capital. I'd have patronized you. I would have taken you to the organizational department of the district committee, David said, shining with some thoughts of his own. No, I haven't changed my mind. My wife is waiting for them at home. I'm getting married, she said confidently. As if there was no doubt, you should. Do you realize what life in the capital will be like now? 
You and your province for two years turned into a boring aunt. And here, Sophia smiled sadly. Do you think the festival will go on forever? No, it's like New Year's Eve or high school graduation. You wait for it, and it flies by in an instant. No, it's going to be different now. Have you ever been to one of the discussions in Gorky Park? Can you imagine? Even the instructors of the regional party committee asked if it was true that Stalin was a criminal. And he calmly explained all the provisions of the Congress on the cult of personality. That's freedom, real freedom. How long have you been warning me against every word that is not according to the methodology? Sophia asked ironically, don't you get it? We have a new life now. Oldman persisted. We'll see. Sophia replied calmly. You come tomorrow at 11 o'clock. You can help me to the station, of course. Or maybe he'll change his mind. Now, I think everything is settled definitively. Sophia was glad to be home in her cozy little girl's room. Her grandmother followed her granddaughter around. She noted the change that had taken place in the girl. Wow. In the winter she came as a girl and now all her behavior is feminine, sedate, and cautious. She's even watching the conversation, as if she was afraid to say anything unnecessary. What's happened to her in the last six months? An old woman, I thought. She approached Nina with questions this way, and that. But the girl laughed and answered that all brides are afraid of something before the wedding. Stephen spent practically all his free time with the Moore family. At the family council, it was decided that the first time the young will live in the house of the bride. Here, and the apartment is large and located in the very center of the city, and the children will go free. Free babysitting is already ready, Sophia's grandmother spoke, and these words caused anxiety in the girl's heart. She didn't know she was pregnant yet, but the mere thought that the father of the child might be Elijah was leading to panic. What to do then? Bring shame on the whole family. What would they say about her parents? This isn't a movie. The circus is life. And that's the kind of thing people don't forgive. What about Stephen? When have questions like that ever driven you? Sophia was exhausted. She hid her head in the sand like an ostrich and said it can't happen. It can't happen to me. The wedding was set for September 7th and a couple weeks before. Sophia felt the telltale signs of a goat cab. The first to notice the bride's interesting position was her grandmother. When her granddaughter refused her pro-buttery thin pancakes with apples and cinnamon. Then Sophia began to turn away from both, from the frying, and from the smell of the then fashionable cologne cipher, which was generously used by Nathan. Stephen's a bastard. Now I understand why he went to Moscow for three days, as if he couldn't wait a couple of weeks and the festival. What about the festival? Smiling happily, said Grandma Sophia blushed, hid her eyes, and winced with a terrible premonition. And there was nothing to blush about. It's a worldly matter. All women are born for this purpose. And children are joy. The meaning of life. I'll see how happy you are. If I give you a grandchild, was angry with herself. Sophia thought she could tell Stephen everything and go to another town at least until the birth. What if it's Nathan's child? Then there would be a son without a father. And why a son? After a moment, Sophia asked herself a new question. Maybe a daughter. But her subconsciousness told her it was a future child. The boy only kept silent. And who was his father? More Sophia and Nathan Stephen's wedding in town would be remembered for a long time. The only restaurant in town was booked for the celebration. Usually families did that from the apartments took out of the apartment to the neighbors all the furniture and set up the tables around the room. The young couple traveled to the registry office in a company car. Jana, although he refused this idea for a long time, a brass band from the Palace of Culture was invited for dancing. Heavy thoughts of worry lately receded and the bride had fun together with the guests. And she, embarrassed, stood up under shouts of bitterness and modestly kissed the bride. According to tradition, the guests wished the young ones a peaceful sky above their heads for many years of life and many children. After the wedding months of heavy uncertainty began for Sophia, fearful thoughts left her only at school, where she worked as a French teacher. And when she came home, 
the young woman could not find a place for herself. Stephen, who was over the moon when he learned that Sophia was pregnant, tried to please her in every possible way and did not understand what her spouse was so afraid of. Why are you so worried? He asked Sophia. The doctors say that you are doing well. You've never been a coward. Several times the woman broke through to tell her husband the truth, but stopped at the last moment. Stephen, don't worry about it. All pregnant women get a little crazy. It's just that everyone's craziness manifests itself differently. Some demand the moon from the sky, others with pickles, and our moms panic. Take my word for it. The bigger your belly gets, the less your wife will fool around, said grandma. And so it happened. As soon as Sophia felt the baby's first tremors, everything else ceased to exist for her. She was no longer interested in how he would be born or what would happen if the baby was dark-skinned. In an instant she loved him and realized that now she completely belonged to this future human being, and she was not there at all. Yes, her physical condition improved. She no longer felt nauseous in the mornings. She was no longer dizzy and had plenty of energy. Sophia enjoyed shopping with Stephen in search of the best threads, hats, blankets, although to find something exclusive was very problematic. The light industry worked without a personal average buyer. True, once the couple was lucky and managed to buy a German stroller. God, where do you get so many things? The grandmother was indignant when the spouses came with another bag in the closets already enough for three people. Or maybe we will give birth to Christopher and immediately start producing a daughter. Then already with a small child is no more shopping, answered Stephen. The woman jokingly swung the kitchen towel at her son-in-law and replied, okay. The manufacturer has found. You make your roads and children are enlisted in love and born in agony. The due date of labor was approaching and I began to worry again. The weather outside was beautiful in the gardens with bright islands of blooming bushes. Peaches, apple and pear trees were about to blossom, but the woman sat at home and refused to go out for a walk. She spent most of the day in her room, looking as if she were thinking about the problems of the world and could not solve them. Sometimes, when no one disturbed her, she would revisit the festival photos, trying to explain to herself what had pushed her into Elijah's arms then. For as time had shown, Sophia had indeed loved firmly, quietly, securely, and that single night was a bright flash of meteorite, flying through her life and dying. Soon, there would be no memories left, just as there would be no memories of the fallen stars. Mom, can you come to the birth center when I'm in labor? She asked Molly one day. Of course I can. I just don't understand why. I'm a surgeon, not a midwife. What are you so worried about? I've had several conversations with Lisa. You're a healthy young woman. You'll give birth before you know it. What if there's something wrong with the baby? Sophia asked. Molly couldn't even in her wildest dreams imagine what her daughter meant by wrong. So she calmly answered what could possibly be wrong. We've never had Down syndrome or hereditary diseases in our family. And no black babies were born in our family either. Sophia added in her mind. Sophia was not herself the last few days before the birth. Grandmother began to guess that there must be some serious reason for such behavior. But her granddaughter answered to all questions with one thing. I don't know. Just different things going through her head. Everyone breathed a sigh of relief. When on the eve of the May holidays in the middle of the night the household was awakened by the mad voice of Stephen. Wake up quickly. We are giving birth to an ambulance. First out of her room came the grandmother, as if waiting by the door. Why are you shouting? Are you in labor, or have you forgotten where the phone is in our apartment? The father rushed into the living room, but Molly was already dictating into the phone without any fuss. Sophia's address came out of the bedroom, holding her stomach. She was already packed her bag. Don't forget, she told Stephen, and he rushed into the bedroom to get his things. I'm sorry if anything. Suddenly, the laboring woman added, it was like parting with a loved one. Before she died, these words worried the grandmother. I'm an old fool. I had to find an approach 
to find out what she was longing for. She thought about it and said, I'll go with you too, in case you need help. Yeah. Did your father and the neighbors get sick? Said Molly. All right, calm down. It's just me and Stephen. The rest of us are waiting at home. Why don't you take me? Smiling through her tears, Sophia asked. It's a joke. Cleared the air. Everyone stopped being nervous. Clearly and quickly answered the doctor's questions, fill out the call card, and went to the ambulance. At three o'clock later, a miracle baby boy weighing almost four pounds was born. When Sophia heard the baby crying, she clutched her eyes and whispered to herself, Lord, may this be Stephen's son. It was probably the first time in her life that a woman had ever appealed to her creator and sincerely believed that her pleas would be heard. Mommy, would you like to meet your son? She heard the midwife's voice and did not understand where her mother could be in the delivery room. Only after a few moments, Sophia realized that she had become a mother and that she was being addressed. She turned her head and saw the blonde baby in front of her, looking at her mother with cornflower eyes. All the anxieties of the last few months seemed to evaporate. She was overwhelmed by a wave of inexpressible maternal tenderness. How handsome, Sophia whispered, admiring the baby. She was not embarrassed by the reddish wrinkles, the face or the wet icicles, the hair, the mother saw her son as he was in her imagination, an angel sent to us on earth, and now no one could convince her otherwise. Can I hold him in my arms? Sophia asked. What do you want? Said the midwife. Come to your senses first. There is someone to take care of the baby. Tomorrow they will bring the baby to feed. Then you can go to any of them. A week later, the young mother and her son were already at home and Nathan Christopher in an instant subordinated the way of life of the whole family. The baby turned out to be absolutely healthy and did not require any special attention to his person, except for those moments when he began to feel hungry. Then his insistent loud crying was heard not only in all the rooms, but also in the neighbors. Sophia was overwhelmed by maternal feelings, and she could not imagine how she had lived without this little man. Stephen would rush home after work to walk with her son and not miss a swim in the water. Christopher was loved from the first days of his life and expressed displeasure when taken out of the buzzer. A sailor would be a certainty, said John, whose dream of long distance travel never materialized. Less and less often, such a family idol was arousing. You're not guilt-ridden about the events that happened at the festival, and she began to remember as if from the outside, as if watching a movie, only occasionally standing by the baby's crib. And she asked herself, would I have loved Christopher if he had turned out to be? She wanted very much to answer in the affirmative, but the woman tried to be honest with herself and could not say so with certainty. Maybe that's why sometimes when she looked into her son's huge blue eyes, she saw before her the man who could be his father. Time began to pass quickly. They say that happy people don't notice the clock. And before Sophia knew it, Christopher was walking. As he told his first poem, as he went to school for 10 whole years, every day brought the woman only joyful moments. Life seemed so safe and secure, as if there were no troubles and sufferings in it at all. And then, as if someone decided to show her the black side of existence and turned her life into a series of not returning their losses. First, her grandmother left this world, despite the grief and the black void created by her death. Sophia consoled herself with the thought that all people are mortal and her grandmother was already in her 80s. And two years after that, her father died. The shard left in his chest from the war years and quietly sleeping under his heart for a quarter of a century suddenly shifted. John probably didn't realize what had happened. So hasty was his death. No one had time to say goodbye to him. Nor did he say any parting words to anyone. Other Molly had barely learned to live without loved ones. How did this new misfortune happen? Just before graduation, Christopher was tragically killed while building a bridge. Stephen poorly secured slab, snapped off the hook of an underground crane, burying three people under it. This is punishment for my sin. I lived with him all my life, hiding my adultery. 
and he loved me, loved me all these years, believed and trusted me. She said to me mentally, standing near the closed coffin and asking for forgiveness. So a third grave appeared in the city cemetery. In just a few years, the family had been halved. Christopher, seeing the state of his mother and grandmother after the funeral, was about to give up his dream to enter the Naval Academy and decided to stay in the city. Graduated from the Polytechnic Institute, I'll become a builder like my father, but I'll stay with you. There must be a man in the house. How will you be alone without me? He said, but the women objected with one voice. There's no need for sacrifice. You promised your grandfather to be a captain. So fulfill your promise. Who will feel better if you stay here and only dream about the sea? Go to Leningrad. Father would have wanted that too. Molly was the last to pass away and she was only a few months away from the day Christopher set sail on his first voyage. She had been fighting cancer for almost a year, but lost that fight. During those terrible days, the only thing that saved Sophia was work. She spent the whole day among the children and tried to stay longer at school so that she would not be alone with her grief at home. Long and hard she learned to live after the death of her loved ones, to live and enjoy life. She dreamed that Christopher would bring his wife home, that their children would be born, and that the rooms would once again be filled with happy voices and laughter. But the son was in no hurry to start a family, and when asked by his mother he jokingly paraphrased a famous song. First things first, first things first, motor ships, and the girls, and the girls after that. Actually, there were girls in Christopher's life who could fail to be impressed by a blue-eyed blonde in a white tunic. After each voyage, he came home in his dress uniform, which allowed him to make quick acquaintances, but perhaps his heart was not yet ready for serious love. Therefore, he did not bring any of the girls he knew into the house. But as they say, nature and the years take their toll. His time had come. Mom, tomorrow I'll bring Miranda to visit and you'll tell me honestly whether she's the right wife for me or not. One evening Christopher pleased his mother. Sophia laughed. You'd think if I said I didn't like the girl, you wouldn't marry her. Yeah, I'm getting tired of hearing it. It's like your whole life depends on her. Or maybe it does. Seriously, Christopher said. And the woman realized that this time her son had fallen in love for real. Who's Miranda? Sophia actually already knew perfectly well. However, as well as about all of her son's previous relationships, despite the fact that the city carried the status of a regional center, it with the surrounding villages had just over 100,000 residents. Therefore, one could easily learn about each person from friends, acquaintances or acquaintances, acquaintances, and Sophia's social circle was very wide. Colleagues at work, parents of pupils at the school where she had been principal for 15 years, and the electorate of her constituency. In recent years, she was also a member of the city council, and she knew Miranda Slurra's mother personally, because after the death of her husband's parents, she first turned to her as the best neurologist in the city, and then women with similar fate began to become friends, sometimes going to cafes or the movie theater together. But she didn't want to tell Christopher about it, let him think she was in the dark. The next day, the son brought the bride to visit. During the communication, Sophia realized that the girl is even better than people around her said about her. The fact that Miranda was very beautiful was not worth mentioning. Christopher always chose girls who could safely be sent to the Miss World Galaxy or Universe pageant and be sure that they would not be left without the crown. In addition, the girl's speech made it clear that she was educated and well-read. And from the way Miranda looked at Christopher, it was clear that she loved him very much. What else could a mother of an only son want? Mom, my bachelor life is at an end. I will return from the next voyage and get married, said Christopher firmly. Why wait for the next flight? Sophia asked, aren't you afraid that such a bride will be stolen from you before you know it? Tomorrow we'll go to Miranda's mom, and if it's okay with her, we'll start the wedding preparations you have plenty of time before your flight. We'll make it, but you'll be a married man by then. Christopher noted that the mother said let's go to the mother, not the bride's parents. 
and realized that she already knew about Miranda everything, and aware that she didn't have a father either, but he didn't get angry with her, he felt very happy. But how do you like your future daughter-in-law? Asked Christopher after he had walked the girl home. She's a beautiful girl. Only did you ask her if she'd be willing to wait for you for months at a time from your wanderings. She does, she does. Too bad they don't put spouses on the same team. She'd be at sea with me. And what would she be on the ship? A cook or a maid? Mom's not being sly. I can see that you already know not only that Miranda is an aspiring doctor, but also her entire biography. I wouldn't be surprised if you know her mother too. Okay, I give up. I do know her. She and I are almost friends in misfortune, both widowed early, never found worthy replacements for our husbands. But enough of the sad stuff. Let's think about what we're going out with tomorrow. Perhaps we should buy a ring. As if we are going to get married. Unsure, said Christopher, kind of like Christopher's mother. Of course we're getting married. The ring is strange, Sophia added and went to her room. A few minutes later the woman returned. In the mother's hands was a velvet box, which she gave to her son. See if this will fit. No one has ever worn it. I just tried it on. Christopher picked up a gold diamond ring. Pure water. Mom, you never told me we were underground millionaires. Where did we get this ring? What's the big deal? It's just a little ring. Sophia was surprised. She didn't know much about jewelry. The woman wasn't interested in jewelry. Only the wedding ring she never took off her right hand. A small one with a very expensive stone, Christopher replied. And you're not wrong. This ring can't be expensive. I'm certainly not a great connoisseur of women's trinkets, but look how the stone refracts the light. Let's go to a jewelry store to make sure. Why do we have to go anywhere? It's a nice ring. It's fine. Or Miranda won't wear it without diamonds. The woman tried to make a joke. Mom seriously said Christopher, don't take the conversation sideways. Tell me, where did it come from? Sophia thought for a moment, as if deciding whether to tell her son her secrets, and then answered it's one of our family secrets. Someday I will tell you the story of its origin. But now is not the time. Further events developed as if an experienced scriptwriter had written the whole course of the play, and the performers exactly realized the director's idea. The next day Miranda and Christopher applied to the registry office. Registration was scheduled in a month, so the young couple still had almost three weeks before Christopher's next flight. The bride liked the ring very much, but she also had questions. Rarely in those years people were given diamonds for an engagement. The wedding was celebrated at the same restaurant as Sophia and Stephen's marriage, although there were several other quite decent establishments in town. Even the question of where Miranda would live while her husband would be sailing the ocean was resolved quite painlessly. Christopher wanted his wife to move in with Kathy and live there even when he was on a voyage. But my mother-in-law, being a sensible woman, suggested another option. I, of course, would only be happy if Miranda spent all her time with me. But Clara will be lonely too. Perhaps it would be better if Miranda stayed with her mother. She would visit me often. Miranda looked at her mother-in-law with gratitude. She was glad that they would not have to start their married life with a spat of misunderstandings. After the wedding, the newlyweds left for 10 days in Soki, where they spent almost all the time in a room at the Pearl Hotel. The reason for this was not the desire to be just the two of them, but the terrible weather, which lasted all the time of their short honeymoon. It was good that the hotel had a swimming pool with seawater, or they would never have swam like that. Can you imagine? Clouds, rain, storm, and we swim in the pool, as in a quiet harbor, enthusiastically told Miranda. After Christopher returns, it's good. He's probably been in every ocean already. I've only been to the sea three times. Don't worry. You and I will have many honeymoons ahead of us. Christopher comforted his wife. We'll go swimming. And maybe the three of us will take a trip. The female half of the family won't be there yet. Christopher told Sophia. I'm on vacation. Unfortunately, it won't work out. Sadly, replied Miranda. My vacation is already coming to an end. 
On Monday, Christopher went to work as a young husband to Odessa, where his ship was waiting for a flight, and Miranda moved to her mother's house. Sophia was alone again. Sophia was alone again, but she had gotten used to being alone, and even began to see the advantages of it. Or rather, she persuaded herself that there were advantages to being alone. First of all, you do not need to adjust to anyone. Secondly, you can devote all your time only to yourself and do what you want. And thirdly, there was always an opportunity to meet with any of her friends. Now there was a chance that Miranda would actually visit her. To say that Kathy had fallen in love with her daughter-in-law from the first meeting would be wrong. She loved her son too much to give her feelings to anyone else. But she had Christopher's happiness first and foremost in her mind. So even if her daughter-in-law did not have even a tenth of the virtues that Adriana had, she would still treat her well and try to maintain a good relationship with her. In the evenings, the woman reflected on her new status. Before Christopher's marriage, she had considered herself a middle-aged lady, but now she suddenly felt the weight of the passing years. In a few months, she would turn 50, and it was as if she had not lived yet did not enjoy and full a woman's happiness. Soon the grandchildren will go completely grandmother will become. Is that it? Is it true what they say that a woman's age is short? Sophia asked herself and immediately answered, and what else is needed? Married, I've been married. I experienced family happiness. A beautiful son grew up. I've made a good career. People in town respect me. But subconsciousness insisted that not all the cases to the end, she brought to the end. It was too early to rest on her laurels. One evening Sophia, lying on the couch, looking at crossword puzzles, occasionally looking at the TV screen. The program time was on. The main news program of the day. On the screen in almost every story appeared a young politician with an ugly mark on his head compared to the other general secretaries of the CPSU. He optimistically declared about the beautiful future, which would come almost tomorrow, and a new life would begin. My God, that there is at least one literate person in his entourage. Is it possible to make such a mockery of the Russian language? Thinking alone is worth it, and Azerbaijan's dialogue is aggravating. I will not be surprised if these pearls will spread throughout the country and local authorities will speak like this after him. Sophia was talking to herself. She was thinking about culture and politician speeches for a long time, but her attention was attracted by another story. Kirill Lavrov said in a solemn voice, There are ten days left until the Twelfth World Festival of Youth and Students in Moscow. Guests from 157 countries will come to the capital of the world's first socialist state. So that, Kathy didn't listen further. The screen showed a video of the country preparing to welcome the delegations. She looked at the modern streets of Moscow with festival symbols, but saw them as they were in the distant 1950. A few minutes later, a sports commentator was already talking about the next records of Soviet athletes. The woman turned off the television went into the bedroom, took out an old leather-bound album, and began to look at the black and white photographs. Was it really me? Sophia asked herself, did I really dream that night? Why did I do that? What was it? An obsession, passion, curiosity, frivolity. She lay awake for a long time trying to find answers to these questions. Then she imagined what would have happened if Elijah had actually sought her out afterward. But how could he find her if he only knew her Moscow address? How could he have traveled to the Soviet Union? The freedom at the festival was a one-time action by the government, and then the nuts were back on. The next day, Miranda came to visit, not a trifle her at the beginning, and imagined where the motor ship Christopher is now. According to the schedule tomorrow, they will be in Sturgeon, said the daughter-in-law persuasively. I have now found myself a childish activity found in the closet school atlas and move on the map paperclip. That's how I travel with Christopher. Stephen, thought Sophia. It seems that the ship with the African delegations sailed from Street Stephen then too. That's too many reminders in two days. So Christopher will be able to call tomorrow. Miranda continued. I'm going on a trip too, said my mother-in-law. 
Although 20 minutes ago I didn't even think of traveling. I want to go to Moscow. I haven't been to the capital for a long time. I'll buy us some fancy clothes. I have vacation money from the maternity hospital. There's probably nothing in the stores for the festival. The decision matured very quickly, and now it seemed that she had made it a long time ago. And I'd go with you, but work won't let me. There will be different concerts. Foreign singers will probably come, Miranda said dreamily. Of course they will. And you know, I've already been to the festival 28 years ago. It was also held in Moscow then. And I worked as a translator. And Sofia started talking about the hot summer of 57. Of course, without mentioning the most important event. I can't believe it. Foreigners were just getting to know each other on the streets, and artists were performing in squares and parks. And there was no KGV? Miranda asked. Of course there was. I have the impression that the KGV was always and everywhere. Yes, we just didn't notice it. We were young. Did you feel the euphoria of freedom? Okay, let's end this evening of memories. Tell me, what can I bring you from Moscow? Miranda thought for a moment, and then like a child she blurted out bananas, and she had never eaten us in her life. The train arrived at Kazansky Station, which was already decorated with festival symbols and banners with welcoming slogans. The festival emblem glowed brightly in the night darkness. Kathy noted that there was now a dove of peace in the center of five multicolored petals. Everything was prettier and brighter than it had been in years, but somehow it didn't evoke the excitement the woman had expected. She went to the cab stand and, busy with her thoughts, stood at the end of the line. Not ten minutes later she was in the car. What was the address? Where to? The driver asked. I don't know the address. I'm going to a hotel or something, Sophia replied. I don't think so. Now you're just staying in a hotel in the capital. It's always a problem. And now the festival is coming up. You'll have to search and I don't guarantee it'll be quick. You're turning on the meter. Of course, I didn't think of that. But we have to stop somewhere. The cab driver, a pre-retirement man, was very talkative. He began to ask the passenger where she came from, what she was going to do. He began to give advice on what places to see. And then, seeing that the woman was reluctant to answer, he started talking himself. Now it doesn't even feel like the festival is on the horizon. Only the advertising reminds you of what it was like in 57. The man looked at Sophia, and wanting to compliment her, said you must have been a little girl then. You don't remember anything. The woman smiled. She was honest with herself, and knew perfectly well that she looked her age, except that her figure retained its girlish shape, but she was glad of the courtesy. No, I remember everything perfectly well. I think there was a vernissage of young artists here, she said as the cab passed the clear ponds. That's right. The driver was pleased that he had found a common topic of conversation. He knew from experience that the closer to the client, the more tips and get. I met a lot of people back then. I still have my badges and souvenirs. Every guest intended to give me something. I used to be a fool to give them away. But now they're a rarity. Expensive. The driver stopped near the hotel, but there were no seats. Let's go to Zaria, he said. I don't think they've done any renovations there, so they won't put us there. Maybe there will be a room for ordinary mortals. Let's go to Zaria, Sophia replied. I feel that the morning dawn will catch me on the street, and she began to suspect that the driver knows very well what hotels to stay in. But I delayed this moment for the sake of an extra couple of rubles on the meter. There were indeed seats in Zara. Sophia thanked the driver, leaving a generous tip and said goodbye. Eh, yeah, it's a pity you didn't tell your festival story. I should have driven you around the city more, the cab driver joked. Then you would have had to take me not to the hotel, but back to the station. I would have run out of money, she replied. Once in the room, Sophia opened the window. A freshness blew into the room. Going to bed was no longer an option. I'll go wander around the city and look at the posters before the crowds hit the streets, she thought. She pulled a fancy windbreaker out of her bag and headed downstairs. Alas, 
There were no crowds either on the opening day of the festival or on the following days, nor was there any lively socializing. The usual hustle and bustle of a megalopolis reigned in Moscow. The only large-scale event that everyone could see was the demonstration of delegates along Komsomolsky Avenue to Lezhniki. The rest of the time life was buzzing only on the festival grounds and in the Olympic Village, where most of the foreign guests lived. Sofia went to several concerts, visited an exhibition of contemporary artists, and everywhere without admitting even to herself, she searched with her eyes for the blue eyes of a dark-skinned man. Returning to the room, ironized at himself, you old fool, she decided to remember her youth. How will he come to see the girl from whom he had been in touch for only two weeks? He's forgotten all about you. You're the one who thinks of him as the hero of unfulfilled romances. Elijah Maga was actually in Moscow these days. He held a high position in the Democratic Union of Somali People Party and spent most of his time at official events. But when he had free time, he wandered to the places where he used to walk with his wife in the ghostly hope of meeting her. After winning his freedom and turning the French Sudan into the Republic of Mali, the man visited the Soviet Union several times and never gave up hope of finding the girl from his youth. Of course, he had been married for a long time, had five children, but the memories of the Russian beauty did not leave him. And now the blue-eyed Kadyusha, Another symbol of the festival reminded him of the only night of love, which remained in his memory for life. Fate even brought them together at the same time, and in the same place on August 3, they both came to Leninsky Gori at the same time. Probably, they walked along the same alleys, but they were not destined to meet. The next day, Sofia bought a train ticket, went to a few stores. She bought presents for everyone, did not forget the banana, and bananas for her sister-in-law, and headed home at night. The past must be let go. She remembered her grandmother's words to her, after Sophia told her the story of her first and only betrayal of her husband, one should not live with what cannot be brought back. Indeed, it was time to scrap that story. There was happy news waiting for John at home too. Soon she will become a grandmother, although the woman was ready for such a development and she was at first confused. Would Christopher, whom she still thought was not old enough to be a father, she thought, and for the first time she regretted that he had become a captain, or rather, only an assistant captain, and how would the child grow up? They don't see each other for months at a time. He'll forget him. The two mothers, in the absence of Miranda's husband, cared for her as if she were the first pregnant woman on earth and tried to anticipate her every wish. Christopher learned of the fact that he was going to be a father in the motor coach, where the motorboat was underloading. There was no limit to his joy, but the return trip turned out to be a torture for him. The man wanted to be near Miranda and take care of her, but instead he had to settle for short conversations on the phone. The ship arrived at its home port at the end of September, and in two weeks the next voyage was due. The captain, seeing that his assistant could not find his place, let him go on a week's vacation. Christopher expected a wife with a big belly. He was surprised to be greeted by an almost unchanged Miranda. What's wrong? Where is it? Is that worried? He asked. Miranda laughed. Nothing has happened, except that you are about to have a daughter. My belly is in place. You probably imagine that it grows on the second day after conception and the woman walks around with it for nine months. Wait, what daughter are you talking about? We're supposed to have a son, Christopher said quite seriously. And who decided that? Miranda laughed again. Or did you have a prophetic dream? The man was confused. He realized he was talking nonsense. But to be honest, Christopher had never even thought that it would be a girl. But girl is a girl. Peacefully, he agreed. Although I know for a fact it's going to be a son. The end. The fall and winter passed in joyful anticipation. Once again, Christopher came home in mid-December and stayed with his family for almost a month. From the voyage he brought a whole suitcase of beautiful suits of bottle nipple toys. Our son will have all the best, he said, proudly showing the female part of the family dowry for the baby. And where are the bows and dresses for our daughter? 
his wife's dowry. We're going to have a son, Christopher said firmly. But after a second added a, I will bring dresses in case we have a girl next time. Miranda began to worry that her husband was so stubbornly unwilling to realize that it might actually be a girl. She shared her concern with her mother and mother-in-law. Don't worry about nothing, said Clara. Your father also said it would be a boy. And then he got mad when I reminded him and said he always wanted a daughter. Yes, it's a pity our husbands didn't live to see these days. Our baby will have two grandmothers and no grandfather. Sophia encouraged the conversation. The due date was April 3. Christopher was glad that by that time, he would be able to return from the voyage and meet his wife from the hospital. But the baby was rushed into the world a little ahead of schedule. Miranda had spent the night at her mother-in-law's house that day. Sophia woke up to someone shaking her by the shoulder. Mommy, I think I've started. Smiling guiltily at having to wake up her mother-in-law, Miranda said, Mom the first time after the wedding daughter-in-law called me mom, rejoiced Sophia. She hugged her and with tears in her eyes cheered her up. Don't be afraid, my daughter. We'll make it work. She rushed to Nathan before the ambulance. She forgot her bag at home. But where is the ambulance? She paced the living room. She was about to call again and make a mess. When she saw the blue flashing beacons in the window, thank God, she said, you go to the maternity hospital and I'll quickly get my things and join you. The woman's acquaintance came to the call. You what? All three of you are going to give birth at once. Laughing, he asked, but only Miranda smiled. On the faces of the mother and mother-in-law, there was the same stamp of triumph and anxiety. The laboring mother was led into a private room, and Elena was left alone in the hall. She remembered how she had given birth to Christopher here, how she had been tormented by doubts about who the father of the child was. And those doubts drowned out all other worries, even the pain. Clara arrived. Her co-workers suggested she go to the residence room, but she stayed in the lobby with the bundle. The women tried to distract themselves by talking, but they did not succeed well. Time stretched very slowly. Finally, a nurse came out and said that Miranda Nathan had been taken away by the peoples. Everything would be all right. We comforted each other, united by the common anxiety and expectation of the mother. About 40 minutes later, a nurse came out into the hall and hiding her eyes, said Clara. The doctor asked you to come in. What's wrong? What's wrong with Miranda or the baby? Almost unanimously asked the women. Don't worry. The mother and the baby are doing well. There's no need to worry about their health. But the doctor wants to talk to you. Can we go together? We'll put on gowns and masks. No, Clara. You know we have a strict regimen. They only let you through because you're a doctor. Adriana's mother followed the nurse. And Sofia was left to wait in ignorance. If a black baby had been born in Moscow or Leningrad at that time, it would not have been an extraordinary event at the maternity hospital. International students are plentiful, and international marriages are arranged, and international children are born. But here in the Caucasus, where almost British Moors still reign, Jenna, a doctor of almost 40 years' experience, was seeing this for the first time. She didn't know where to start talking to her colleague. First of all, don't worry, Adriana is doing great. Not even a single tear. She's a good girl. She followed every command exactly. Breathing properly. Your grandson's condition is a nine on the scale. You know we don't give anyone a 10, but there is one thing. This baby is from Miranda's husband, but not by the Holy Spirit, of course, by the husband. What finally happened? I'm really excited. If Jenna realized she couldn't delay the news any longer, Miranda had given birth to a black baby. Careful, she said. So what? You know yourself that many babies are born with dark skin. What's the problem? Don't you get it? Miranda gave birth to a black baby with typical features of race. She thought the joke was a silly prank. But Jenna's face remained serious and concerned. And what does Miranda say? Finally, she asked. She doesn't know anything yet. I showed her the baby from afar, right after the birth. I don't think she saw it. 
I need to talk to my daughter, the woman said insistently, and then added doubtfully, although I'm sure this baby is Christopher's. Understand, the conception happened either just before the wedding or when they were on vacation. Where did some come from? Miranda doesn't need any more excitement right now. She needs a good rest before her first feeding. You'll be picking up the baby, won't you? Jenna asked. Of course we are. It's out of the question. Immediately answered Clara. Then go now to the mother of the son-in-law and well. Dig into her family tree. Ask around your relatives. There might be an answer. In the lobby, Sophia was already going crazy from the unknown. The visiting hour was approaching and the relatives of the women in labor were gathered near the window with their packages. They cheerfully chatted with each other and proudly announced, with what height and weight the child was born. Finally, out of the door came Clara Nikolaevna, and from her face, the woman realized that something out of the ordinary had happened. Let's go home. I warned the superintendent that I won't be coming to work today. We have a serious matter to deal with, she said. Miranda and the baby are fine. Yeah, everything's fine. It's the other thing. Only when the women were in the apartment and sat down in the chair, Clara said in a detached voice. Miranda gave birth to a black baby boy. How that could happen, I don't know. But you realize she couldn't have changed Christopher, right? Not John. It felt like Paul had gone underfoot and someone had taken all the air out of the room. She tried to breathe, but a sharp burning pain echoed in her chest. Sophia, Sophia, calm down. We will definitely find an explanation for this, soothed Clara. She quickly pulled out of her bag a vial of Valadol and handed the matchmaker a tablet. Put it under your tongue and breathe deeply. I'll open the window now. But Sophia had already pulled herself together. And Miranda had nothing to do with it. It's my sin. But believe me, until today, I was sure that Christopher was Stephen's son. I never said anything about his father being black. Except that none of us in the family have those cornflower eyes. They're just plain gray. And Sophia told the whole story of how she met her. She remembered how terribly afraid she was that she would be born and how happy she was when she was shown a blonde boy. What are we going to do now? Guilty, she asked. Do you know what they do with children? They raise them, love them, spoil them, answered Clara, quite peacefully, so long as Christopher didn't think anything bad. The next day, against all established rules, the women were allowed into Miranda's room. She was there alone. The mother rejoiced and immediately asked anxiously why the baby was not brought to me. It's coming. Only you must listen to your mother-in-law first, replied the mother. He'll be here in time for my discharge. Christopher's fine. I called the port. The boat is expected to arrive without delay. You listen to me, girl, and don't judge. The woman took out a black and white photograph of her next to Mago. This is Christopher's father and pointed to the dark-skinned man. We met at the festival. And why did it have to be told now? Already knowing what had happened, Miranda asked. Your son looks a lot like his grandfather, replied the mother-in-law. Forgive me, my daughter. If I had known that Christopher was Elijah's son, I would have told you sooner. Miranda was silent for a few minutes and then said quietly, ask me to bring my son at last. He must be very hungry. The motor ship arrived at the port almost on time, but airplanes to nearby cities were only the next day. And in the second half, please send me something Christopher asked the administrator to do. My wife gave birth. She's being discharged tomorrow. I have to meet my son. Don't worry, if she's already given birth, she's not going anywhere. Neither your wife nor your son answered the girl. Go to the ticket office and get a ticket for tomorrow, before they're sold out. But I'll be in town in the evening at best, and my wife is discharged from the hospital after the rounds. Christopher wouldn't give up, not even the French perfume he was bringing his mother-in-law as a present. He was on his way to the ticket office when the receptionist shrank over him. Tomorrow at 6.30 there will be an extra flight to Mineral Waters. Some delegation is flying, there are free seats. Quickly go to the fourth ticket office. I've already called from there. 
I think it won't be a problem to get there. You'll be on time. Christopher was over the moon. At nine o'clock, he was already looking for a cab driver who would take him 250 kilometers away and offered to pay a triple meter fare round trip and a bonus to the maternity ward. He drove up with a huge bouquet of roses. At that moment, Miranda mother and mother-in-law with baby in her arms were heading towards the car. He ran over to Jim Miranda, picked his wife up in his arms, then walked over to Clara and held out his arms to take his son. Christopher froze in indecision. A whole range of feelings ran across his face, from amazement to indignation. And in the end, he sat up with anger. Don't forget to pick up your things, shouted the cab driver, exposing a suitcase from the bag on the sidewalk. These words brought him out of his stupor. He went to the car, paid the driver and returned to the women, hoping that this stupid joke would be explained to him. Christopher, don't make a scene. Miranda said calmly, your mom will explain everything to you now. This is your son, although he doesn't look like you. Christopher looked questioningly at his mother. She guiltily, smiling, confirmed yes. Christopher, this is your son. I will explain everything to you at home. Six months later, Sophia sold her luxury apartment and moved with her son, daughter-in-law, and grandson to Krasnodar. Here, the dark-skinned baby was paid less attention to, since he was not the only one in the city. Christopher never showed any appearance of doubting the stories told by his mother. But from time to time, the suspicion of a poisonous snake crept into his thoughts and poisoned his life. He calmed down only when, during the next flight, he handed over biomaterial in one of the laboratories in Marcel. DNA research had not yet been conducted in the Soviet Union. He was the happiest man when he got the result. The probability of paternity was 99.9%. From that moment on, he set out to find his father. Why? Sophia asked him, do you realize you could ruin someone's life? I mean, he must have a family. You only knew one father, Stephen. Let's keep it that way. At first, Christopher agreed. But when Charles turned five, he was determined that he had to do it. As I'll explain to my son, he's not Slavic in appearance. A year or two from now, he'll probably start asking that question. Don't you yourself want to meet the man who fate has willed to become the father of your son? I'd like that very much. Perhaps he has the right to know that in distant Russia there is a continuation of him. Then you're the man to do it. You're fluent in French, aren't you? Write a letter to the embassy. Maybe something will come of it. To the surprise of the Nathan family, the reply came pretty quickly. Three weeks later, the official letterhead said that the request had been forwarded to the wanted man, and if Mr. Non-Magician would consider further communication possible, he would certainly inform about it. And in another week, Sophia received a letter from Elijah. This time, too, the Non-Magician was flying as a private person, so they had to get to Morocco first, and from there they already went to Russia. How many years has it been? Thought the man when the airliner flew over the Mediterranean Sea. Not even my country, not hers, is no longer the same, but the invisible connection between us has not broken. I always knew that I leave in Moscow not only my pleasant memories, but why didn't she answer any of my letters to my Russian son, 35 years old? My grandson is going to school. We're a lifetime late. In Domodedovo to a strange family where all the adults were European and the child was dark-skinned. No one cared. The baby looked at the arriving passengers with interest and noticing a man with dark skin asked hopefully if it was my grandfather. Finally, the arrival of the flight from Casablanca was announced. One of the first to enter the lounge was a slender young man. He looked around the hall with confused eyes trying to find familiar features in the faces of those he met. As soon as his gaze stopped on India, he quickly walked towards them. There's no doubt about it. It was the Sophia he had been thinking of for so many years. But before he reached a couple of steps, he stopped abruptly. He didn't know how to proceed. Hello, Elijah. The woman said calmly, although she had dozens of emotions raging in her soul. Meet your son Christopher and grandson Charles. 
While the adults stood in a stupor, the baby screamed grandpa, ran up to the man and hung around his neck. Afterward, two years after this meeting, Christopher with his wife and children moved permanently to Mali. The family made this decision, first of all, because Charles was still a stranger in Russia and felt uncomfortable at school and on the street. But they came to Russia almost every year to visit their mothers. Now no one is waiting for them here anymore. Sophia and Clara died one after the other about 10 years ago. They lived together for the last time and now rest in the same cemetery next to their husbands. From time to time, a young dark-skinned man with cornflower eyes is seen near the graves. He carefully places wreaths on the slabs and then stands by the graves for a long time. Probably, Russian blood does not let him forget about his homeland and his ancestors.